Hi, I'm Nancy Snoke. I'm Phoenix Snoke. <laughs> and our talk is Hacking the IoT, a case study. So briefly, how this talk is organized, we're going to do contact information at the end, a quick introduction, um, a look at IoT security standards briefly, talk about our methodology, our results, and setting up your own IoT lab. And then we'll do contact info and questions. So why a talk on the IoT? Um, well, apparently two thirds of consumers are concerned about IoT devices and there are constantly stories about security holes. <laughs> what? Oh. And there's always worms and botnets with hundreds of thousands of devices. Are we building Skynet? Will the internet ever be secure? <laughs> yes, and uh, one thing I wanted to interject about the security part is that uh, I feel in some ways like I'm being a little paranoid about this, but uh, it, it seems like more and more news sort of validates this. Um, these companies, they, they harvest enormous amounts of data on people and the problem is at the same time they're doing things like having production servers with uh, username passwords of admin admin and uh, things like that and uh, well I mean if companies that have financial data for hundreds of millions of people are doing stuff like this the people that make you know your your Wi-Fi enabled fridge sort of you know really you're probably gonna be held to a lesser standard and if everyone else is hacking the IOT why shouldn't we so then we had to decide on a device to hack. And first we just randomly decided to buy an IoT light bulb. Um, not this one, uh, but the one we got literally did not work at all. What we later uh, figured out about it is that the uh, company that made it, they had decided that there was a problem with the, uh, with the uh, functionality of it for the networks, so they disabled it because they were going to patch it back in at a later date. Uh, these devices only connected wirelessly. There was no plug or anything for anything else. So yeah, obviously they aren't gonna be able to retroactively patch network functionality into a dead device. It is an absolutely lovely light though. It's very nice hue. So yes, after our very expensive light bulb experience, we did a little research on devices before going and buying another one. I considered getting the uh, e smart egg tray, which tells you when you need to buy more eggs. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, it seemed a little annoying because you'd have to take each egg out of the carton and put it in this for it to work. So uh, we decided to look elsewhere. We considered the Nest thermostat, but then there have already been about a dozen things about the security vulnerabilities in Nest, so we thought it had been done to death. And then, this is my husband's favorite. The Wi-Fi enabled crockpot. Uh, there's something about being able to send people fire over an internet that appeals to me on a spiritual level. Um, however, my wife and I have um, sort of a disagreement about doing things involving fire inside our house. She hates fun. Oh, and then the next one is the Wi-Fi enabled smart water bottle. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I looked at the screen. That one missed me. Yes, I am not really sure about that one. Um, I've kind of tried to figure out what sort of personal uh, customer data they'd want to use to uh, harvest with such a device, but it's probably best left not really thought about too much. Yes, and, and then there's the smart water bottle. The smart water bottle, using the power of the cloud, tells you when you are thirsty. The bottle lights up to say, hey, drink some water. <laughs> we, we thought about this one because it was kind of weird, but it was like maybe just a little too weird and kind of ridiculous. Um, additionally, there might be some sort of overlap between that and the thermometer people that I'm not really sure about. So we selected a baby monitor. Why a baby monitor? Well, <laughs> last year, um, yeah, we started getting lots of advertisements about getting baby monitors, most likely because of that one over there. <laughs> There's one of his better photos. Um, <laughs> but yes, so 
Yes, everyone said we should get one, and we were like, why do we need a baby monitor? Not to monitor the baby, but hey, we can hack it, so yay. So we did some research, and we decided on this one. Name taken out because they are non-responsive completely when you notify them of faults. So, so I've taken out the name. It was a reasonably priced one we found on Amazon. That was also a number one bestseller. So that means lots of people were using it. <laughs> and there was um, some language in the wording that just gave a hint of insecurity in when you read about the description. So it was, uh, you couldn't tell definitely from the description, but it was just like, that doesn't sound like that's the way it should work. So we were like, let's get this one. So we did. Okay, so now before we get into our methodology, let's briefly talk about IoT security standards, and briefly because there isn't much out there. Um, the Internet of Evil Things report put out by Pony Express every year, and they kind of basically, it seems like the whole report is a summary of everyone knows there's security problems with the Internet of Things. No one is spending any money to fix it. Um, that was the majority of it. Yes, I'm skipping over a few facts and figures, but. Um, then we know that um, NIST put out their special publication, 800-183, The Network of Things, which is to give us a language to talk about security in the Internet of Things. But it's just verbiage, verbiage so we can start laying out a standard. It's not any actual security standards. And they divided them into five things, a sensor, an aggregator, communication channel, external, utility and a decision trigger, where the sensor is your hardware, the aggregator is like your firmware on the hardware, communication channel is of course your network or your Bluetooth, Zigbee, whatever, external utility is your mobile app, your web app, whatever you have there, and the decision trigger is like the thing that makes the water bottle glow when you're thirsty, it's the thing that does something smart. And then Microsoft has a document uh, about their Azure IoT which has some things that can be generalized and some that are very Microsoft specific and Yeah, um, I, I'm more familiar with some of the Microsoft stuff that they're doing than she is, but um, they're actually uh, trying to do like an entire sort of program to uh, address how insecure some of these devices are. Uh, the approach that they're wanting to do apparently involves taking control at the, at the uh, assembly level. So like they want to actually be dictating how things are put together in the first place. Um, they kind of have a mixed track record on this sort of thing. Uh, I don't want to be, I, I don't want to really be um, where I'm making a decisive statement about it because this is, as far as I'm aware, I don't think they're even going to implement all this stuff for like another two or three years. So, I mean, it's all stuff that's actually in the pipeline. So you can't really say how it's going to end up being at this point. Um, I, I like the idea of it, but again, I like a lot of ideas that tend to have really bad implementations. So, I mean, you know, I can't really go too much into it, but um, at least somebody's making an effort there on this because right now it seems like a lot of people aren't. All right, so before you actually start testing, first thing is to actually look at your packaging and read any manuals that come with it. And then before you hook it up, we set up a test segregated test network and we also did some brainstorming for ideal attacks so that we knew what we were trying to achieve, what our goal would be. So as far as looking at the packaging, I don't know if you can see it here. Will my red thing work? Down at the bottom, there's this nice thing that has like an ID number and a password of admin on the packaging. <laughs> so th that looks bad, just the box. But if you read the manual, you find out it's not quite as bad as that. There are, um, according to the manual you have here, you have to make an account for yourself. And then this is actually the ID and password for the camera. So you're, you make your personal account which has its own password, and then you have to add uh, cameras to it, and you can add many cameras to your account. And when you add a camera, you do get forced to change the password if it's the default. Um, they make you choose something that's at least six characters. So, And there's also a lot of other good things about the authentication authorization in the manual. So um, one thing was there is no forgot password mechanism. <laughs> so um, basically, if you forget your account password, you have to make a new account. 
and then re-add your cameras because that and your other account will stay. <laughs> Please enjoy this appalling lack of professionalism. So your other account will stay active, just you don't know your password. If you forget your password for your cameras, then you have to do a factory reset and then go back to the admin password and reinstall them. And um, one thing, a lot of the stuff we were doing sort of overlapped each other. Uh, one thing that I was fi figured out from doing network on this uh, is that the not having the, the reset password where it just makes you have make another account, there's no way to kill accounts. So if somebody compromised the account on the camera, they could still get into it. Uh, additionally, you can't talk little one. Additionally, uh, you could have cameras on multiple accounts. So somebody could, in theory, compromise the device, make their own network for it, uh, and then put, it, put the devices on there. You would have no way of knowing. Since they send to a portal, there's, there's no separate traffic. And just one more thing to note from the manual um, was that there was some information about two different accounts uh, types. You had the main admin account, but there's also you could enable a guest account, which had um, less privileges, just viewing, basically, of the cameras. So it would be that was something else we put on our list to do is to try out the differences in the access control. So the first thing we wanted to do for the networking parts of this is that we wanted to have a separate test network. That way, it, uh, since we're not sure how secure this device is and we're wa wanting to run a test on it, we keep it separate from our all, of, all of our personal stuff. That part's pretty uh, simple. We, you know, bought another router. Um, one thing I would advise is that um, I've seen some of your weirder routers have some security issues. So I would advise against getting like some sort of fly-by-night thing from like Alibaba or something like that because the, the router itself might have problems. And so, you know, you're trying to separate whether the uh, problems that you're finding are with the router or with the device you're testing. But yeah, I mean, simply I just got on Amazon, I bought like some old links of stuff. All right, and then the last thing we did was we looked at ideal attacks. I specifically wanted to try to attack the device pairing and my husband liked the favorite of bad movies and TV shows where you insert fake video to going to the stream of the application. It's right up there with when, when you know, stuff's getting really serious and like two people are using the same keyboard. <laughs> so, and the reason we came up with our attacks was so that we could sort of keep in mind as we go through and enumerate bugs and look at how we could daisy chain those together to create one of these. So we had a goal to work for. So I originally divided this into five areas, but I've since changed my mind, and it's four areas of an IoT device to test. Um, so if you see the original talk we did, like at NOLACON in May, it was five. But I'm, I've since combined web apps and the API. So we have mobile apps, the network, the web app, and API, and the hardware. And I'm going to talk about the mobile app and the web app API. And Phoenix is going to talk about the network and the hardware. And Baby Lawrence is going to look cute. Um, and it is a disclosure where we're really trying hard not to break laws. We did not break any laws. <laughs> and the, so for the external web application and the API calls, out and the external network, we were mostly observing very lightly, maybe sending through some specific commands, et cetera, just to see, but very carefully, everything was carefully considered to make sure it wasn't doing anything illegal. Uh, the other thing about this is the areas that we decided to separate these out into, um, depending on your own personal preferences or feelings, they, they might not, th these lines aren't as clearly defined anymore as, as you would think. Um, for instance, I can see including the network into some of the API and, and uh, web app stuff. But I mean, yeah, there's stuff that overlaps. So um, first, the mobile app methodology. And this is pretty standard for both Android and iOS. You start with your static testing, then you do dynamic, and then network. And for the static testing on Android, that's the easy thing. That's just decompiling it, looking at your Android manifest.xml, looking at the source code, that sort of thing, really easy. For iOS, it's the whole process, and there are apps that do this where you actually have to get the unencrypted byte code off of it and look at it in a reverse engineering tool like IDAR Hopper. Um, 
Then you have your dynamic, dynamic testing, and on an Android, that's mostly using the Android debug bridge or um, hooking it up to a debugger and just running tests. And on iOS, I use SciCrypt for that. And the network testing, I always just use Burp Suite for. And a note on this, because I don't have a slide on this for the findings, uh, for the network testing, neither app, the iOS or the Android, did any sort of certificate verification, pinning, anything. So you could just hook up Burp to it, man in the middle it, nothing. And there was no point in putting a slide for that, so. Um, and I'm just looking at a few of the results for the mobile app because I could go on way too long. So just a couple of the glaring mistakes. Um, so almost everything that could be insecure was we had insecure data storage, insecure communication, insufficient cryptography, extraneous functionality, and improper platform usage. Name five of the mobile top ten by OWASP. Um, first line of code I was just going to bring to life I saw here was this is where it was validating a camera ID to see if you'd entered a valid one. And so you could see you could easily enumerate them all because it always starts with the same six characters and is linked 13. And that's all the validation they do. So you could go through and start enumerating all the different cameras they created. Um, then I noticed this also going through the code which is a developer options password that's hard-coded. So you can get to a special developer options page in the app with this hard-coded password. Okay, the next finding. This is a bit of a nemesis for me. I hope nobody else ever has this problem. But I look at all these apps, and this is a mobile app, so there's no reason for this to be here at all. And there's this cryptography algorithm that I find from place to place, and I've done it four or five times now. It horrifies me at first, and now it sort of makes me laugh hysterically. Any guesses? <laughs> what, what cryptography algorithm do I find everywhere? <laughs> it, this actually is a crypto algorithm, but yes. <laughs> It's actually, it's actually single des, single des, which should never be in a mobile app because it was broken before there was such thing as a mobile application. <laughs> I think that was broken in like '97. Yeah. So it's just like, why are you using single des now? They didn't do everything with this. They had some unencrypted passwords, <laughs> <laughs> like they in the shared preferences. There's my account password. As you see, I use Nancy password two when I'm doing testing, and Nancy test two for an account name. <laughs> so that helps me keep track of what I'm doing. But yes, they unencrypted your account pass na word names. Um, in the other shared preference file they have, it's much harder to read, but they actually have an encrypted password for the device, as well as some other shared preference things that are interesting. Like you could turn the developer options on here, in the shared preferences, and they have all the lookups of where their API calls go to, and well, several other interesting options in there. Um, so obviously, I made it to the developer options. In fact, I did that in three different ways. It was the easiest thing to do was to get to their special developer options. I also found that you could easily get to a um, forgot password functionality. There is no forgot password, but they apparently built it at one point, took it out, and left the code in. <laughs> so why? No clue, except it just was just to, um, I guess, make everything more amusing. But I'm going to leave off the mobile findings there, although there were more, and Wait. let Phoenix talk about network. Yeah. We'll, sw we'll trade it there. Um, now, in terms of the mobile stuff, uh, as a side note, the uh, hard-coded dev password was actually in the network traffic as well. <laughs> um, so yeah, there were there were, I could have got into the developer thing too, but I didn't need to. But yes, so basically, what we want to do for our network methodology, you know, I'll kind of go in the general, and then I'll explain what we did specifically here. Um, I'm gearing this towards people who are starting out, so I'm sorry this is redundant, but. Um, you know, the first thing we want to do is, you know, use Nmap, figure out what's, what's where so we know what we're looking at. 
Uh, we also want to observe the traffic. For, uh, I used Wireshark and Aircrack NG. Uh, there is no right way to do this. If there's a tool that you use that you're comfortable using and you can get everything to do what you want it to do, then that is the correct choice. Um, I just don't think you should take what me or anyone else says is gospel there. But yes, so anyhow, what we find with this device is uh, there's the, the web server there at port 80. Additionally, there is this, this weirdo thing at 8600 called Asterix. Um, I had to look up what Asterix was. It's some sort of Eu European air traffic control tower software. So I assumed, obviously, it's some sort of false positive. Or it's a really cool baby monitor. Anyhow, I made a note to myself to just sort of check it out later. Um, that's another thing that you want to do, uh, particularly with hardware and networking, is that you want to document your your work. That way, you don't end up skipping stuff or you know doing something two or three times. But um, I just made a note to myself to look up the asterisk stuff. If we have time, I'll explain more about it. It ended up being something even dumber. Um, in terms of the network traffic for the device, there was no encryption whatsoever. Uh, other than the encryption for the router, if you were within range, you would be able to watch the videos from this device. Oh, and it had audio too. Yeah, you could transmit too. Uh, additionally, there was a setting to turn the device into an access point. The best part about it, no password or encryption. Like, you literally couldn't enable it. Um, additionally, with this one, the way that it was set up, if you had it in regular mode or in this, it uh, would tell you all the networks within range of the device, like it would tell you the SSIDs. They're uh, outside the scope of what we're doing here, but there are attacks that people have done uh, that I'm pretty sure they've actually executed in real life, it's not just proof of concepts, uh, where they were able to determine physical locations based on all the SSID data. So in theory, somebody could take one of these and figure out where you live. Um, obviously, since these are devices that most people kind of consider a security device, that's kind of a, a, a bad thing, especially since they could then just, you know, look, look in your house with the camera and listen and see if you're home, whatever. Oh, and, and, and yes, thank you. Uh, the, the other really delightful part about this is that turn it, you could turn the device on and do all these things remotely. You did not have to be present. You could do it over the Internet. So you could turn the device on re remotely, set it as an access point, uh, enumerate everything in that person's neighborhood, and then, you know, figure out where they lived, look at the camera and all that. All right, so then we'll take a quick look at the web application methodology. It's just like testing any web app. You want to look at your authentication, your authorization, session management, injection, client-side code, etc. And the API is basically the same as that with a few um, add-ons for specific um, API things, like if it's SOAP or JSON or etc. Uh, but the first thing I found was on accident across site scripting. I have a habit of naming things script alert one script and that worked. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a joke. I do it as a joke. So I wasn't actually trying to find cross site scripting. Um, but um, so this was the external web app. And as I said, I was mostly just observing on this. Um, but when you got to the external web app and just look at the source for it, it was a little bit weird because it looked like they were um, hosting about 20 sites for the same basic portal there. And they had things like, if you're trying to reach this host, then we want to direct you to the back door of this IP address. And so by doing that, they showed that they had debug versions of this up and test versions. Like they had about 10 different versions of the web app uh, out there on the web that you could just browse to, <laughs> which was just weird, I thought. And as I, I was a little wary of doing too much, but I went and browsed to some of them. And at least one of them had this nice thing where you could download all the different versions of the app and um, extra documentation. So there was even a Windows version of the app and a Mac install like on the hard, so you could like install a, that was actually on your computer as opposed to the Android, the iPhone as well. And then they also had this SD tool thing you could get to at one of them. But yes, as I said, I was very wary of actually trying out too much here on the ex external. Um, I'll, I'll go more into the SD tool one. But 
What was interesting to note was almost everything was in client-side code. Um, there was a ton of JavaScript that was doing all the API calls. It was JSON JavaScript. And then there was a big thing in Flash, um, which is what played the live stream of the camera. Okay, and of course, Flash things are reversible. Um, and so when we did reverse it, we saw that it was based on an RSTP, but it had um, authentication built in on the front, like some homegrown authentication that wasn't done properly. Um, because it only cared about it in one direction. It was like it was caring that the uh, server was correct, but not the client. So. They weren't verifying that they were both talking to each other correctly. It was just a, oh, yeah. So um, for the API, I'll just say that I did still left in this API methodology, but basically it's the same as the web app, except you want to identify the API technology and enumerate your API calls is the big thing. And then you check for your common problems, which are like, poor transfer layer security, IDOR, poor access control, et cetera. So the interesting thing about the API findings, as I, I think I already said, it's all JSON and JavaScript. And it was the complete enumeration found in two places because it was all done in the client-side JavaScript. You could see it there. And the Android app completely enumerated it uh, too so because it made calls to it. So that was easy to find. And so then I went through and I did uh, I tried, made sure we tried all the API calls, and then we tried replaying all the API calls. <laughs> and the replays worked perfectly, even waiting a week or two later. And so then we started doing integrity checking to see if we could tweak the API calls. And there, some of them worked and some of them did not. So it depended on the call whether or not you could tweak the data inside it. There are about 30 different calls. And there didn't seem to be any rhyme or reason, like it was calls related to a certain thing that didn't work. It just seemed like it was random ones that you could change the data to. So, I mean, for all I know, that was actually a mistake that some of them didn't work that way. But there was also some information disclosure, like this was a call to get an NTP server, but there was also this great debug telnet thing that it sent back. Like, I, I didn't go to it, but it's just like, why are you telling me where there's a debug telnet device as well as some other things? So, it was very weird, I thought, because you're like requesting the NTP server, and it's like, oh, okay, here's the NTP server, and here's some other things. <laughs> Yeah, I just, why? So that was just odd, but I think that pretty much covers the API, unless people want to see a list of them, but. All right. Um, so for the hardware methodology, uh, keep in mind this is the first device that I decided to hardware hack. So I went into this with zero experience whatsoever. Um, I know at least two people here that are actually really, really good at this, much better than I am, that I can see in the audience. So um, what I'm saying is that, you know, the fact that you're actually here on a nice Saturday instead of, like, doing something else um, indicates that you're willing to learn about it. So don't feel like you're, you should be intimidated by this. I'm stupid, and I managed to not destroy the thing. But um, so, you know, don't, some of it's a little daunting. Don't, don't let it intimidate you. Uh, again, if you if you really thoroughly document what you're doing, that also helps if you do screw something up, so you can hopefully figure out how to undo it or uh, you know figure out what you did so you don't do it and, uh, do it again. But in terms of the methodology, it's pretty simple. We want to take apart the device and we want to take a look at it. Obviously, I did the hard hardware methodology last because you know I wanted to make sure if I destroyed anything, it w wouldn't interfere with the other stuff we were doing with it. Uh, you could buy multiple devices if you want to. I'm kind of surly and cheap, so I did not. So again, I did it last. Um, wanted to look for a UART port, since that seemed to be the easiest way to do it. We also wanted to look and see about how to get the firmware updates. Um, in our case, we were able to do it multiple ways. Uh, we were able to do it through the network traffic as well as through the uh, hardware device itself. 
Additionally, you could actually do it through the web app. But, um, and then we want to see if it has any sort of signing or integrity checks. Um, one thing I determined with this device is whenever you'd boot it up, whether you'd done anything to it or not, it would say, hey, I failed the CRC check, booting in three, two, one, and then go right into the login. So it did have a CRC check, and it would actually tell you that things were wrong. Apparently, out of the box, things were wrong, and um, it didn't do anything. It just booted normally. Excuse me? You boot. So for the hardware findings, the debug UART port. So I'm looking at this thing, and uh, some of the some of the uh, writing on it's in uh, Chinese, which I am not familiar with. But um, in any case, I'm able to find the UART port. It's kind of subtle. But uh, since there's three since there's three in this case, we know that one of them is going to have to be a ground, and we know that one of them is going to have to be transmitted. One of them is going to have to be received. That's just the only way the device wouldn't function otherwise. So anyhow, in my case, uh, there are a lot of easier ways to do this. Uh, they involve purchasing equipment that I didn't want to do because, again, I'm being certainly and cheap on this. So I used the multimeter to determine which port was which. Um, and then I checked two or three more times just to make sure I wasn't going to host something because I was a little in intimidated by this, which is why I was warning everybody. I soldered them. I bought a uh, their t -t 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 USB to TTL. You know, they're, they're like about 12 bucks off Amazon. And then hooked it up to a Raspberry Pi. That way, if I destroyed anything, I destroyed a $30 Pi instead of my uh, home PC. But everything booted up. Anyhow, um, we pulled this up from the other menu from the web app because it was just easier to look at for using for a picture to demonstrate that there were multiple ways to do this. If you see there, there on the uh, top right, there's an online upgrade. That let you uh, download firmware for updates for this. Um, additionally, you see there's an upload upgrade directly underneath it. If you had the device booted in there, I think that's the next slide, but yeah. you could up upload your own firmware. And uh, yes, it would tell you that it was wrong, but then it would, it would work, so it was oh so right. Um, and yeah, there was absolutely, I, I'm not even entirely sure why they had checks on this stuff since the checks didn't actually disable or stop anything from doing anything. But here we go. Um, and he didn't actually go into how he got the firmware from when we did the upgrade. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I cut myself. I, I, I grabbed it multiple times, so, um. Additionally, uh, you're able to grab the firmware update through the network traffic. If you do, went through the web app to do it, it would actually download the firmware update directly to the device itself. I intercepted the traffic, was able to get it that way. But um, you could also get it off the device itself. You could get it from the, from the prompt there too. So they, it's like some of the password functions. They, they put it in a lot of places just in case you missed something and really wanted to, to uh, get into the device. It's very nice of them. Okay, so we looked at putting together one of our ideal attacks, and what we decided to do was um, we put up a, um, we used the movie idea of putting in the fake stream. That seemed the most doable after what we'd seen. And uh, what we ended up doing was faking out the authentication that the uh, web uh, server was expecting and sending our own stream in. We had a few problems with this. It had to be a very specific size, and the video had to be the exact right quality, so we had to tweak it. But we <laughs> managed to get um, Hellraiser streaming through our, to our, our web app. So if you look at the live feed, you're seeing that. As opposed to our adorable son. <laughs> so uh, we were... Um, additionally, the way that the web portal worked, I didn't, I didn't do it on the screenshot because I just didn't see much of a point, but the way the web portal worked is the timestamp was the current time on the web server. So if you were feeding through old footage from uh, a week or a year ago, it would tell you it was the current time. So again, this kind of overlaps the whole thing about how these devices are meant to be used as, a, you know, they're, they're, they're security tools. Somebody being able to just put anything in there, you know, while they're, you know, watching the device through your house. 
So our conclusion about hacking IoT devices was that most IT devices are easy to hack. And then also I think we wanted to make a note on could is there any possible way of using this baby monitor safely as a baby monitor? So we thought about it and we decided, well, what if it's not hooked up to a network at all and we just use the internal web application to observe? So we keep it on its own segregated network, not on ours. So it's not an interface Yeah. And we tried that. And um, it would give you the picture, but the live stream is broken because the live stream calls out. <laughs> you could not do the live stream unless it was internet facing. So, um, yeah. Uh, it's completely broken as a baby monitor if you want to use it securely. Um, so anyway, let's talk about setting up your own IoT hacking lab. And yes, that's a picture from the Matrix, not our home, unfortunately. Um, He's lying. <laughs> <laughs> well, so first, some of this stuff is going to be pretty general because I just started listing everything I possibly think about in terms of what those basic tools are. So I was like, what do I use when I do Android stuff? I was like, a computer. <laughs> so I was like, and then I was just like, that's a little um, too um, obvious. And I was like, well, you never know. And then I wanted to say, with an Intel processor, because we want to use the Haxum, you know, um, which is a hardware acceleration module for the Android emulator, um, which without it, everything runs horridly. I tried doing some of this on an Intel, and it runs to the point where you could try to get it to open, and after about 30 minutes, I'd give up. So, I mean, when it, they say it doesn't run very well, it doesn't run very well to the point of being totally unusable. I mean, I suppose that does depend a little on the actual stats of your computer, because sometimes you can get to run just annoyingly, I mean, if you have a really good computer. But, yeah, you really do want to um, use the hardware acceleration, which only works on Intels. So then, obviously, for Androids, I use the Android Studio and their SDK tools, which include the Android emulator. And I always get several versions of the OS and have both ARM and x86, which sometimes comes in handy. And it'll warn you really badly um, about getting both ARM and x86, because it doesn't like that. It, it wants you to only use ARM. Um, but yes, it says that it'll be slower and not work as well. But sometimes you might be using something that has a special library that's designed for that hardware. And so if you're reverse engineering it or running it on an emulator, you need to have both. And then all the Android Studio tools, like the Android Debug Bigs, um, and the shell and the ins tools to install APKs, get them, the debugging, all of those. Um, Android devices are nice to have, but always optional. Um, I have a general call out to all people who want to get rid of devices, they can give them to me. <laughs> so, you know, if you have some you don't want, you can give them to me. Um, <laughs> so, um, Dex, I use Dexter Jar, APK Tool, JD GUI, and Burp Suite. Um, and there are some other tools that will do like some automatic scanning of Android apps that I've used, but they're not part of my general suite, so I didn't list them. For iOS, obviously, you need a Mac, which most people probably know, but I didn't when I first decided to start hacking iPhone stuff. I got some iPhone, an old iPhone from my sister, and was like, all right, I have what I need, because I knew you needed an iPhone. And I was like, wait a second, I have to actually go buy a Mac. <laughs> so, yes, yeah, so some people are stupid enough not to know that, me included. Um, <laughs> So then I use Xcode, which is for the iOS SDKs, and obviously iPhones. And yeah, I've gotten four or five of them from fr friends and family by just having that general call out. Um, and obviously you have to jailbreak them, which is illegal in some countries, in case you're in any of those. Yeah, I don't, free, don't say you know us. And then you want use some other tools, like I use iFunbox, IDB, Burp, Iden, Hopper, SciCrypt, and Snoopit are some of my main tools for iOS. Uh, in terms of the network lab stuff, it's pretty easy. You know, we want to have extra router. Um, you can get more than one if you really want to. Uh, external uh, USB adapter, such as an alpha, if you wanted to uh, monitor the, all the traffic. In my case, I actually did put the uh, 
put it into promiscuous mode so I could try to see if there was anything that, that was there that shouldn't be. Um, in, the, in this case, I wasn't really picking up anything that was unusual. Um, I know there are other things that you can use besides alphas. Uh, I don't know anyone that has one that's not an alpha. Uh, the big thing you want to see, if you're going to use Aircrack, if you go to their website, they'll actually list compatible hardware. So you want to make sure that something that's compatible for that, obviously, if you're going to try to use Aircrack. Uh, the rest of it, I was just using built-in Kali tools like a Wireshark, Aircrack, obviously, a TCP dump. And then for the web, it's just your normal web pen test to burp or zap and nick to and other scanners, your development tools for Chrome and Firefox, um, cool SQL map, BAPT or BEST or all the normal things as well as special things for your API components and API calls. Like So if, if you have WSDL, you'll need, you want to use special tools for that or um, so for XML, RPC, et cetera. But and then for the hardware stuff, I mean, th this is probably pretty obvious. You want to have a screwdriver set of some sort. Again, we were trying to we were we were trying to to uh, uh, make sure that we we included everything we could think of instead of leaving out obvious things and having people get mad at us. Um, you want some sort of solder and iron and solder remover. Uh, I use a TTL SUB. Uh, again, these were on Amazon for like 10, 12 bucks. They're they're pretty inexpensive. Um, multimeter. There are other nice things to have, like you know Raspberry Pi, like what I use to uh, connect this. You can do things like uh, logic probes, things like that, that will actually make finding some of these ports tremendously easier if you're not a weird person. But um, the one thing I would I would kind of uh, warn about, uh, first off, if you're going to solder something, solder something you don't care about first, because um, soldering is sort of an yeah, so he he will gladly teach you. But um, yeah, soldering is kind of like painting or drawing. Um, your hands might not, y you know, you have an idea in your head of what you want to do, but your hands might not cooperate. And uh, depending on what it is, you know, it could be a little bad. So um, if you're going to get, you know, a multiple hundred dollar item and decide to solder on that first, um, I wouldn't do it. But, you know, hey, you do you. Um, but, you know, I would just I would just try to practice on, on things that you don't really care about first. That way, if you screw something up, it ain't a big deal. Um, the other thing I would I would say is that if, if you aren't sure you even want to mess with this stuff, you really don't have business getting like bus pirates and logic probes and all these good things because you're not going to use them. I mean, again, if you want to do it, that's fine. But I mean, it's not something you have to have. And I mean, I think in a lot of cases you really kind of do and not just hardware, but software too, um, evaluate if you actually want to use a tool instead of just trying to accumulate everything you can just for the sake of it. All right, and so if you want to read more on the Internet of Things, there's a really good book by Brian Russell called The Practical Internet of Things. Um, the NIST uh, special publication I mentioned, there's a link to it. It's special publication 800-183. Uh, and the other thing I mentioned was the Internet of Evil Things report, which you can get from Pony Express. And um, a useful blog for getting started on hardware hacking that we thought was um, the Hack the Word World blog, and we specifically looked at their router example. As they actually walk all the, all the way through the process. They actually walk all the way through the process, so that's really, really great if you just you know want something that's going to kind of guide you step by step through it. And um, contact information. I'm on Twitter. My husband refuses, um, but you can grab our contact information if you'd like, and we'll take questions. And I probably, yeah. Maybe I don't want anyone to actually contact us. <laughs> <laughs> that was a joke. I, I'm totally fine if you want to send me emails. That's not a big deal. Um, especially if, if you had any questions. If you, if you were starting out and you had any questions about some of the networking or any of that, but that, you know, certainly feel free to you know, shoot me an email. It's not a big deal at all. But are there any questions? We have five minutes, so we timed it perfectly to get five minutes oh, of questions. Tell them about the, the report. Well, let's see if there are questions first. Anyone? Do you? Zach? Yeah, we remembered your name. Yeah, you're really hard to hear. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. You want to come up? 
And then you can get your question on the microphone even. Here. Okay, so, uh, well, my apologies. Okay, so uh, I know that a lot of these IoT devices run on software that is not necessarily open source and strictly proprietary. As well, and I also noticed that, and I know you gave a disclaimer, hey, your testing was very, very light to dodge any sort of legal, legal repercussions. Like, what sort of legal hurdles would our security researcher uh, run into in their ventures? Um, I'm neither of us are lawyers, so we're not really qualified on, on answering that. Um, I, I know in general, some of the stuff also depends on what country you're in. In some, in some countries, uh, decompiling software is very, very illegal and uh, can get you in a lot of trouble. Um, then there's like, you know, dumb stuff with export stuff. You know, again, don't go to North Korea and say, hey, Phoenix told me to do this. Um, but uh, like the device in question uh, that we saw, there, there'll be proprietary things, but uh, it was actually uh, just regular BusyBox. So, I mean, it was all, it was open source Linux. Um, one thing that, that I've noticed with, with some of the stuff I've looked at is that I'll find a lot of extraneous code, like where they've reused it for multiple devices, and they just sort of slap everything together, and it gets really weird. Uh, that, that weird port that I mentioned earlier, uh, that was actually some sort of debugging Telnet. Um, it, it didn't, I couldn't do anything with it because it would actually drop after about 10 seconds. Like, it would come up for about 10 seconds at a time, which... Um, you know, I was making jokes about how instead of security through obscurity, you can have security through not being able to consistently connect. But um, yeah, that was actually, it, it was a telnet for debugging a device that was uh, a piece of hardware that was not on the chip, was not on the board, was not present in the device in any capacity, which is, which is why it didn't work right. Yes, sir. You, you were one of the people I was referring to about being better at the hardware stuff than me did. <laughs> you know, that's something, we did report all of the vulnerabilities we found to the company in question, um, but they didn't do anything about them, they did not respond, and they have since changed their name. About four times, five times? They've cha they keep changing their name and putting out the same products with a different name under a different company. So they obviously have no interest in fixing anything. Yeah. But, I mean, it's not something I could figure out. What's the point of all of us? Oh. Here you go. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> uh, did anyone else have any questions? Yes, sir. <laughs> Being patient helps a lot. <laughs> All right. Well, everyone, hey, uh, thanks a lot for coming here. Again, you know, like I was saying earlier, I mean, it, it, it's a Saturday afternoon, so I mean, I, I realize that there are other things that, that normal people would like to do. But uh, I do appreciate you all coming up here. And again, if you have any questions or anything, you know, feel free to shoot us an email or anything like that. We're both local to the area, so thank you very much.